Right, greetings, hello, and uh, welcome back to the Philosophy Club mm -hmm. in France. Um, so, happy Easter. Today is the um, Eastern Orthodox Easter, so all over um, the kind of Arab Christian world. There was a Mass today in Jerusalem, um, in honor, no, yesterday, in honour of Mary Magdalene. They have a special feast day for her. Um, and of course in Bethlehem and all the other Christian parts of Palestine and in Israel they're, they're celebrating Easter and in Syria and in um, Greece and Bulgaria and obviously in Russia and Ukraine where they're largely Christian Orthodox. So that's one of the tragedies of this war that it's Christian Orthodox versus Christian Orthodox. So that's one of the absurdities of the whole conflict. Um, and here's a little beautiful icon I was given years ago from Greece, which is a tiny little icon of Christ with a gold halo, which I rather lovely, uh, love. It's painted on a pebble. Um, so that's there to remind us it's Orthodox Easter. And um, so that's fantastic. Okay, welcome. I'm going to start my usual um, sharing a few books, like reference books that I use and that I've written this week. I'm going to look at the ones I've written because maybe people don't realise that I've, you know, written them. Um, like for 30 years I've been writing and publishing stuff, so I thought I'd share. The first thing I want to share, because it's Easter, is this is called the Love Journal. And it's the only academic journal in the world on the nature of love, which sounds crazy. I mean, Christ taught that God is love, and he was always telling his disciples to love each other which in the Ukraine war you'd be surprised at because they're not loving each other by attacking each other, the Russians attacking the Ukrainians. Um, and Christians haven't always been very loving. I mean, World War I was a war between largely Christian nations in Europe and World War II even. Um, but one keeps going, you know. And I discovered years ago when I was traveling around the States in 1992, um, I was doing a study tour looking at mediation and peacemaking. I went to California, San Francisco, Berkeley University. I went to Harvard um, in Massachusetts, and I went to New York, Columbia University. And I was looking at all the library catalogues. And I kept looking, is there a journal on love anywhere? In those days, there wasn't really an internet as such. And, and um, so you had to go to the physical libraries, which I did. I went to the Library of Congress in, in Washington, D.C. And I kept looking for a journal on the nature of love, and there wasn't one. I found some books, um, a, a Professor Buscaglia of the University of Southern California had written a brilliant couple of books on love. Um, you know, he was a psychologist, but nobody had look, were looking at love. So I came back determined to found a journal on the nature of love in London. Um, and I returned to London and we launched it in, um, actually the Zoroastrian house in London um, that year in the autumn term, and I ran a course at the University of London on the nature of love and religion. So I looked at love in Buddhism, in Hinduism, in Judaism, in Christianity, in Islam, and I brought in different lecturers. So um, a Christian vicar spoke about Christianity and love, a, a rabbi talked about Judaism and love. I did the talk on paganism and love and primal religions, but I chaired the others, and it was at Birkbeck College of the University of London. And so that was why I launched the journal. And now it's in its 14th year, 14th edition. It comes out every couple of years. Um, it's a lot of work, you know, like articles and um, studies, I mean, scientific studies. And, but also looking at love in psychology, in music, in philosophy, in spirituality, in religion, and in science. So studies about, you know, the heart and... There's this thing called the Institute of Heart Math that can measure the, the rate of the heart and find what's called coherence patterns. And um, the, the electromagnetic field em um, emitted by the heart is something like eight times as powerful as that from the brain, um, which is interesting. So there's articles about all that. And in fact, it was somebody who worked at the Institute of Heart Math who helped me edit the last issue. And then this is a previous issue. Um, and there's a picture of the Castle of the Muses in Scotland with the Peace um, Buddhist banner. That was our great hall. 
So it comes out periodically. I'm working now on volume 14 of the Love Journal, which is published and it's available. Um, <clears throat> this is another book that I wrote uh, in the last couple of years. It's called The Ethical Calculus, a method for solving complex ethical decisions. And it's, it's a practical manual if you're interested in how you should make decisions in life. Um, should you do this or that? Should you work for this company or that company? Should you marry this person or that person? Should you uh, travel to this country or that country? Those are all complex ethical decisions. I mean, let alone should you invade this country or not? You know, I wish, I wish political leaders could, could get a hold of this book. Um, and it's, it, it presents a study of ethics in all the different traditions. So all the different schools of ethics, like Aristotelian, Kantian, utilitarianism, all the different schools of ethics. And then it talks about um, uh, ethics in Islam, ethics in Judaism, ethics in, in Buddhism and so on, ethics in Confucianism. So drawing on a lot of the table, it gives a little survey of, of their how they help us guide to make ethical decisions. And then it finishes with a very practical methodology to use. So how do you apply all that in your life if you've got a decision to make? Um, like when I had to face the Brexit referendum, which side should I vote for? You know, it's a huge political choice. And I used this uh, method and um, worked out, no, I was for Remain, I was against Brexit. Unfortunately, um, not enough people had, had got my book by then, so they voted the wrong way, in my opinion. And they voted, you know, in an unethical way. Um, and, you know, Putin, when he sat down and decided to, to invade Ukraine, he'd not read my book. He didn't work it out ethically. Um, Pontius Pilate, when he decided to let Jesus be crucified, he hadn't worked it out ethically. He didn't realise, actually, that that was not good karma. So anyway, that's trying to save the world through ethics. And do have a look at it. It's a really important book because it's very simple can be used. This is a very slim book, but really, really important. This is my dictionary, multilingual dictionary for um, multi-faith and multicultural mediation <clears throat> and peace and global philosophy. And it's a dictionary of all different languages and words for peace, justice, fairness, uh, human rights, harmony, the heart, um, holiness, joy, enlightenment, etc. You know, all the good words. So I go through all the different languages like German, Gaelic, uh, ancient Greek, French, Latin, um, you know, Arabic, Hebrew, uh, Sanskrit. Uh, Buddhist languages like Tibetan or Pali or Chinese or Japanese. And I give all the words for these philosophical terms in all these different languages. It's written using the Roman alphabet, so you need to... Um, and it's... it's um, <clears throat> but if you can understand, you know, the Latin alphabet, then you can read uh, the sounds. So, for instance, to pray in Old Gothic was Bijan. Uh, love was Flichathwa. Reason or intelligence was gahuts or frode, and God is guth. So there's there's obscure languages in here. There's also ancient Egyptian, um, which is a language that is absolutely fascinating. Um, it's in the same language family as Arabic and Hebrew. Um, so it tells you what's the word for a woman in ancient Egyptian. St What's the word for a shade or a spirit, an image of God? Sweet. What's the word for the God of the dead? Sokaris. And so on. You know, these Egyptian words, they're amazing. And then um, I've got all the Scandinavian. Dutch is there. Danish, Swedish, etc. Um, so I'd like to... I'd like to make it, um, I'd like to finish the next edition and have it uh, giving the etymology of all the words. It's got African languages, also American Indian languages like Hopi, Sioux, and so on. 
And I think that, um, you know, for the cost of one tank, like, you know, a couple of million, I could employ a, a team of linguists to work on the etymological dictionary. We could get it published by the University of Oxford uh, Press. It ought to be in every academic library in the world. It's the only first ever comparative philosophical dictionary of all different languages. Nobody's either thought of it or done it before. And so whoever's on the budget for the MOD, just don't buy that tank, send me a couple of million, and I'll get the thing upgraded. We can get the etymology, and we can get it published by Oxford. As Spanish is here, Sumerian, um, Slovene, you know, et cetera, et cetera. It's a labour of love, but it... it um, you know, we need we need more help to do the etymology. Okay, then there's this book, which is great fun. This is uh, volume three and a half of my autobiography. And this is a picture of me in Qumran, where the Essenes were on the shores of the Dead Sea in Israel. Um, and this is me wearing an Arab headdress because of the boiling hot sun. It's what one does there, because it's really hot. And this is a picture of the little village on the north shore of Galilee where Jesus um, used to live with Peter and the original disciples. Um, it was a little tiny town of Caphanaum, it's called. And archaeologists have discovered, you know, ruins of the houses and they think they know where Peter lived. There's now a big church over it. He was married and he lived there with his wife and his mother-in-law and... And Jesus used to use it as a home base when he was out teaching around, because he was always going around about the lake, giving lectures and talks. Um, anyway, that this is covering my life from 1993 to 96, during which time I visited um, the Holy Land and um, went to lots of conferences and, um, you know, was teaching at the University of London in those days. So that's, and it's called Volume 3 and a Half because I wrote Volume 3 which covered up till 1992. And then I um, did volume four, which was later, and I went back and did this volume. So I, I sneaked it in as volume three and a half, which is probably unusual. Um, this is another book that's interesting, which is the original feasibility study I did for the University of London to have a Peace Studies Institute. That's where I began my work in Peace Studies. After I graduated, I worked for the University of London to create this Institute of Peace Studies, right? And this is Senate House, which is like the main um, administrative and library building of the University of London. It's in Bloomsbury, in Russell Square. And I used to, um, I studied there. My degree was from here, my history degree. The School of Slavonic and East European Studies was in this building. And I, I loved it for three years. I was a very good student. Used to go to all the lectures and write essays and all that stuff. Um, and then my PhD was examined here as well in one of these um, rooms. Um, interesting enough, during World War II, this was um, called the... Um, well, it was a sort of intelligence arm of the British government, and it employed lots of academics to work on propaganda against um, the Nazis and fascist forces. Um, so people worked there, you know, and I said in my feasibility study, I said, okay, guys, you, you all came together to win the war, but how about winning the peace? Why don't we like get together as scholars and have a center here for peace? Why is it that scholars only work together when there's a war on? The war's gone. We finished that, finished. We won it just, but it was a tragedy for everybody and loads of people died on all sides and it wasn't just absolute good versus absolute evil. I mean, Stalin was pretty evil. He was killing mass Holdemores of Ukrainians and God knows what, you know, um, before even Hitler got into power. So um, so how about we work together to, to build um, a peace in Europe and throughout the world in the Middle East and stuff? So that was my vision, and I put it here in this feasibility study. Um, I talked about all the scholars at the University of London who'd worked for peace in the past. George Bernard Shaw, Sir William Beveridge, who helped build this building. He was a great liberal peer who was a friend of Churchill, who invented the welfare state. Um, Lord Blackett, who was a physicist. Um, Fred Clark, who was an educationalist. Um, Thomas Davidson, who was a great philosopher in his own right. 
Viscount Haldane, Nicholas Hans, and so on and so on, it's a whole list of all the great thinkers who worked for peace. Um, you know, and yet still we haven't got peace in the world, and, and Britain isn't doing its bit. So I said, let the University of London have a Centre for Peace Studies. And this was all the documentation that I presented after the two-year research project. Then, coming to the end, there's this... Um, so one of the things I did as part of my PhD is I set up a mediation service dealing with interreligious disputes because I figured, look, you know, the Cold War has kind of ended. They had more or less by then. But there are all these religious wars still going on in the Middle East, particularly Islam, Judaism, Christianity still fighting. Different sects within them are fighting each other. Um, now we've got the Ukraine war, which is largely a religious sort of fight. Um, between different branches of Christianity. The Russians seem to want to become the top Christians of the world, and they think they need strong armies to do that. I mean, it's very medieval, very stupid, but that's what they're doing with this man, Patriarch Kirill, who really ought to be in a psychiatric ward, in my opinion, along with Putin. Um, so I set up this mediation service dealing with conflict between religions and um, one of the cases that came was the Druids and, and access to Stonehenge. I was contacted by certain pagans in Britain saying, we want mediation with the government because they won't let us use Stonehenge. So we set up a Truth and Reconciliation Commission for Stonehenge. And I chaired about 30 meetings in Wiltshire around Stonehenge and got very interested in the case because it's about do pagans have equal rights to Christians? You know, Should they be allowed their sacred sites? I think obviously they should. And on the, on the back, there's a picture of um, a Victorian childhood. This is my mother's school when they're all dressed up as Druids, holding little sides. This is um, probably sort of Edwardian times, um, the photo. Um, you know, Druids are pretty um, embedded into the culture of Britain and, and France and Gaul and stuff. So why can't they be allowed to have their festivals at Stonehenge? And this tells the story of all that. That was about, like, a lot of work. Um, and it's still ongoing now. They still haven't got proper rights. And then finally, this is another little book that's interesting. Um, the back picture is Castle Duino in Italy, where Rilke wrote his great poems. Um, the Duino Elegies, they're called. And as a poet, I was delighted to go there. Um, it's not far from... Um, was overlooking the Adriatic, northern Italy. So what role is there for global philosophy in peace and conflict studies? It's a smaller book, but I've argued that we won't solve all these conflicts till we actually look at them philosophically. If we could get the philosophers of the world to sit down, representing all these different traditions, and talk to each other in a civilised way, like, you know, like we do in the philosophy club, I reckon we could get peace you know, within a couple of weeks. The problem is the thugs who run the armies and the tanks and build the, the weapons and machines and who don't think philosophically. They're not, they don't seem to have any ethics in them. They just think in terms of power and greed and, and control. Philosophers are, are, you know, we're a bit politer as a bunch. And we're, although we might disagree, you might be a Platonist, I might be an Aristotelian, or you might be a Muslim and I'll be a Jew, we can still share our differences in a polite way. So this book is a kind of manual, how philosophy can help solve these conflicts. So there's, that's a little sample. And then the last book I want to share is, this has just come, new, new edition. This is a biography of Alice Bailey, who we talked about last Philosophy Club, when we did um, the esoterics, we looked at box 125, which is Alice Bailey's teachings. And I tracked down and discovered somebody's done a PhD on her at a university in Australia. This is a woman called Isabel Blackthorne. Um, I never met Alice Bailey, but I knew people that knew her. And she was a, you know, intelligent peace worker working with spiritual forces. And somebody's actually done a PhD exploring her entire life story and all, you know, she had her own troubles and she spent years, you know, uh, in India and then went to the States and it's, it's interesting. I'm looking forward to reading it. It's just arrived this week. So, um, anyway, that's a little sample of some of the books in the library here. And, uh, you know, it gives an example of what, what some of the work I've been doing. Right, let's go. Let's go to the first two. 
and we'll see what we've got today. Okay. So, today, each time, the first box will start as a philosophy box. Right, excellent. And, so in this case, it's going to be... <coughs> um, 147, Logicism and Analytical. Oh, okay. With next to it... Um, have we done Witchcraft already? I think we did. Yes, could be, yeah, right? Yeah, Primal Regions, yes, yes. Okay, yeah. instead... But you were going to do one on the bottom row, which is the sciences. Because in philosophy, the bottom row is more the sciences. So we'll have 147 plus one from the bottom row. Okay. Choose whichever. <laughs> Okie dokie. Uh, Physics. Aha. Uh -huh. Right, 155. Okay. Right. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the sciences more this week because in the philosophy club hitherto we've looked a lot at the different religions. And I thought it'd be fun, because the whole point of the table is to cover the sciences as well as the religions and all the different philosophical traditions. So we're going to look at these. Um, now, <clears throat> um, let's do um, physics first, because in a sense that's the oldest of these two. Um, although, you know, we, can, we could argue that. But... Um, so, let me just find the right page here. It's number 155 in the table. Um, mm, 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 here we are. Right, so if you go to the text, you know, online, it's, it's the philosophy box that deals with physics, but also electronics, computers, and information theory. So it's quite, you know... Modern and now with um, artificial intelligence or AI, it's all the people that are inventing the latest AI or the latest websites or the latest um, computing systems. Um, but the word physics it means things to do with nature because physis is the Greek word for nature, and it was a branch of philosophers really who, who got very interested in what is everything made of. What is the physics, we would say, behind, behind light or behind um, fire or, you know, material substance and so on. And fairly soon they came up with, um, well, there were different theories, but one theory that came up fairly soon was, was backed by um, a chap called Democritus and also Lucretius in Rome, which said that everything's made of atoms little tiny particles so small we can't see them. But that's what makes matter. And when, when it's in the form of light, these particles must be moving, like fire. They, they must be in a very excited state to create, to create that. And physics was very interested in studying um, you know, the natural world. And it goes back at least as far as, as the ancient Greeks. Heraclitus was one of its founders. Um, he said, and he had an intuition that I think is pretty spot on, which is everything is made of fire. At the root of everything, every person, every animal, every living form, every plant, every tree, it's actually made of fire. So the, the, the elements actually convert to fire. Now we would want to say, well, yes, he was almost right, but they convert to energy, not fire. Um... But energy is really just another word for, for what we call fire on our plane. Um, so he was intuitively right. Another great thinker of early physics was Thales, who was... Um, these guys were from um, the coast of Anatolia, now Turkey. Um, and it was a very cosmopolitan part of the world because it was butting up to the um, Persian Empire that was moving uh, westward. And um, some of these people went and travelled and, and studied in Babylon where they could access the old Sumerian, Babylonian legends and so on, and myths. Um, they were advanced mathematicians, a lot of them. And, but it was also 
near Greece, where there was a lot of new thinking, freedom of thought, democracy in Athens, which meant people were free to think in their own way. Um, it was an exciting time to be alive. And the great cities of Miletus, which I've been to the ruins of, and um, Ephesus as well, I've been there. These, these were really cosmopolitan cities, like San Francisco is today. And people were you know, coming from all over the known world to discuss and debate physics and philosophy. Um, before long, I mean, Aristotle also wrote about physics, the great pupil of Plato. He, he was very interested in, in natural forces, natural phenomena, um, why, why things are the way they are, what are they made of, all these kind of questions. And some of his work in physics was very important. Um, and then later on, um, after the, the Christian period kind of sort of stopped discussions about physics, because if you took all truths from the Bible and said, that's it, that's the story, you have to follow this teaching, that narrative is the only one, and you, you shut down all other possible narratives, then what's the impetus to study physics? You know, wasn't really there. And they had this, the, a, 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 as it turned out, a wrong idea <coughs> that the earth was fixed in the middle of the sky <coughs> and all the stars and the sun were all rotating around us. Our physics obviously impacts on astronomy. So it kind of slept, went to sleep for a while. But in the Renaissance, there was a revival of interest in physics, <coughs> inspired by the work of Francis Bacon, Descartes in France, and Galileo particularly in Italy. And they started studying <coughs> the laws of physics. And then Newton came along and sort of really began to explain how gravity works how it can be measured mathematically, which keeps all the heavens together. Copernicus had worked out that actually the Earth is just, is, is moving around the sun like the other planets, we're not in the centre. And that changed the way of thinking. <coughs> and for a hundred years or more, Newton's um, synthesis of the, <coughs> sorry, the, <coughs> His book was called The Mathematical Principles of Natural Philosophy. That became the standard thing which, which all physicists studied. And they set up departments of physics in universities in um, France and America and Britain and Germany. And they, they got very interested in studying the details. Atomic theory took off um, <clears throat> and they realised that... The atom can be broken down. It's made up of even smaller particles. Um, Michael Faraday was important in London for studying uh, the, the strange electromagnetic fields that are around um, things, and especially at a micro level. Um, Eddington and Heisenberg and Planck, these are all famous names in physics, studying the micro details of the subatomic world. Um, and then Einstein came along and confused everybody with the theory of relativity. And, um, <clears throat> you know, he, he, he said that up until then, in Newton's world, time and space were a kind of absolute. Um, they're the, the, the guarantors of an ordered universe. There's this thing called time, which doesn't change, it's always fixed. And then the space, which is kind of uniform everywhere, it's always the same emptiness. Newton confused everything and said, aha, it's not like that. There's this thing called time-space, and that's constantly changing. Which is, you know, <clears throat> you have to really kind of do some deep thinking, but it's true. Since I've been speaking, I've been speaking about physics for, what, 10 minutes max. During that time, the space in which I'm sitting has moved many hundreds of thousands of miles related to empty space, right? because we're on a planet that is moving around the sun the whole solar system is moving in, in, in the galaxy around the centre of the galaxy 
at very, very fast speeds. And then the planet Earth itself is spinning um, at about at least a thousand miles an hour. Um, so we're doing a really complicated movement here. We just, it looks like we're staying still, but we're not. Um, <clears throat> and Einstein pointed out that time and space are interconnected. They're, they're different ways of seeing the same thing. Okay, so that's what you study if you do a physics degree. And um, I, the other thing Einstein did, which is really important, he won the Nobel Prize for it, is he discovered the photon. He, he said light is made of these tiny little particles called photons, and he was able to prove it. Um, and there's some really interesting phenomena they're discovering in physics now, which is um, um, cutting-edge stuff, that if you take a photon and you split it, I don't know how they do that, by the way, <laughs> but apparently they can. You split it in two, and, and one end goes off there, and one end goes off there, and you set them apart like thousands of miles, and you tweak that one. This one is tweaked as well simultaneously at exactly the same time. You can measure this. Which means that there's a communication of some kind happening between the two parts of the photon, faster than the speed of light. Now Einstein said that's not possible. He said the speed of light is the maximum, 186,000 miles a second, which is very, very fast. Um, that, that's going around the Earth 10 times in like a second. That's the speed of light. Um, well, no, they've now discovered, if Einstein was alive now, he'd be working on this and tearing his hair out, that things can move faster than the speed of light. So what is it? What are they connected? Okay, so I'm watching a documentary at the moment from the Scientific and Medical Network, which I belong to because I'm interested in the philosophy of science, um, <clears throat> called The Field, which was made in um, a couple of years ago before the lockdown. Um, Cutting-edge alternative thinkers, physicists, scientists, and people doing experiments with all this stuff. That photon thing I was describing comes from there. Modern physics argues that, and this was David Bohm's idea, who was a great physicist, um, a, a student and friend of Einstein, that, that what we see, the particles, are just like billiard balls on the surface of a great ocean, which we can't see yet. But behind the physical things like photons and electricity and the visual things that we're made of, there's a great field which these are the manifest, um, um, you know, um, epiphanies, if you want. And so physics is now trying to study the field. What is it that actually is, these things are all in? What's that ocean? Um, <clears throat> so that interests me a great deal. Um, right, now, why does physics matter? Well, it's very useful because a lot of us use digital technology, we use computers, we use digital recorders, uh, we use telephones, televisions. They all depend on discoveries in physics um, to, to, uh, to run the computers. They, they realise how to use electrons to zip through these incredibly complicated circuit boards. Silicon Valley invented the, you know, the silicon chip back in the 40s, 50s. Um, I mean, it's extraordinary uh, making them at such a tiny level of complexity that it can record hours of teaching and, and um, you know, <clears throat> what does it all mean? Um, well, that's what some philosophers involved in this stuff are now looking at. Um, and that's what I'm interested in, is the philosophy of physics. I, I, I go along with the idea of the field. I think there is a, there is a, um, it's not what you see, it's what's under the surface that's important in reality. And what, this has implications for medicine because what they've discovered is if you, um, people like the Institute of Heart Math are doing that, that's a place in Colorado, 